From KCRW in Santa Monica, I'm Claude Brodesser Ackner, and this is The Business. So you still want to do the show business, and you think that you got what it takes? I mean, you really got to rap and be all that and prepare yourself for the breaks. Check it out. This week on The Business, the divide between movies that make money and movies that get awards has been growing in the last few years. Why? And what does that say about how Hollywood is changing? Plus, the 1967 Oscars signaled a coming cinematic revolution. Is this year's crop of Best Picture nominees the harbinger of another one? But first, it's the Hollywood News Caravan. Go nowhere, it's the business from NPR. Okay, I'm tired of labor news. You're tired of labor news. So, what are we going to do? We're going to talk about labor news. The Directors Guild members approved their new three-year contract with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers last week. The Guild won't tell us the actual vote count, but DGA President Michael Apted said that members were, quote, overwhelmingly in favor of the deal. Taking that vote as one more opportunity to knee the writers in the groin, the producers released a snotty statement, saying, quote, Our negotiations with the DGA proved beyond any doubt that when both parties are prepared to bargain seriously, groundbreaking new media labor pacts can be reached without resorting to harmful and unnecessary strikes. Their statement neither acknowledges the writer's strike as having helped move along the director's deal, nor does it mention the DGA deal explicitly did not set a precedent. A sunset clause was inserted, one that allows both sides to revisit new media when the agreement expires, which means we're all at square one three years from now. In other news, ding dong, HD DVD is dead. For the longest time, Toshiba's HD DVD format has been Hollywood's equivalent of Mike Huckabee, hanging around, hamming it up, but with no real chance of getting the nomination. When Warner Brothers signed up exclusively with rival format Blu-ray last month, it was the beginning of the end for HD DVD. But while Toshiba may have lost the battle, it doesn't mean that Sony has won the war. According to Toshiba CEO Atsutoshi Nishida, quote, the real mass market opportunity for high definition content remains untapped. End quote. Indeed, with Apple TV, TiVo, Netflix, and Blockbuster all working on movie download services, chances are people won't be using DVDs of any kind in the near future. So the Blu ray HD DVD battle may just become a footnote in Hollywood history. And finally, she might be radioactive in Hollywood, but Lindsay Lohan's still the bomb in New York. The business website Portfolio.com reported last week that Lindsay's nude Marilyn Monroe-inspired photo shoot for New York Magazine got more than 20 million page views on both Monday and Tuesday of last week. Portfolio also says that the print magazine is benefiting too, selling more than 500 subscriptions last week than average, and more than 1,000 individual back-order copies via its website. In related news, Marilyn Monroe rose from her grave and announced that she'll be starring in a remake of Herbie Goes Bananas. And that's the Hollywood News Caravan. Coming up later in the show, a look back at the pedigrees of this year's Best Picture nominees. But next, Oscar's Big Fish are box office guppies. The Oscars were created as a glittery publicity stunt for Hollywood and its product, helping it sell its stars and its movies around the world. The event also became a major television event, attracting a huge global audience and millions in advertising. This year, a single 30-second spot during the Oscars will go for a whopping $1.8 million. But a funny thing seems to have happened on the way to the Oscars this year. Listening in on the rehearsals at the Kodak Theater before the show, you have to ask yourself, when did the Oscars become about rewarding serious filmmaking? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jack Nicholson. Cute. I love Nicholson. 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 Eight years, there are only 79 the Academy has honored with its greatest tribute. 79 movies that are known simply as Best Picture. This year, the five Best Picture nominees are very much outside Hollywood's financial and aesthetic mainstream. In fact, a recent article in The Hollywood Reporter points out that the five Best Picture nominees are, quote, on pace to tally the second lowest total for that group in two decades. And that number would be way lower if tiny independent film Juno hadn't surprised everybody and pulled in more than $150 million to date. 
But what does it mean for Hollywood that so few have seen No Country for Old Men, There Will Be Blood, Michael Clayton, and Atonement? Stephen Zajcik wrote the analysis of this year's Oscars for The Hollywood Reporter. Stephen Zajcik, welcome to the business. Thank you very much. Good to be here. So there was a time when when Oscar-winning films were also synonymous with big box office. In fact, in, in 1967, I think, four of the five Best Picture nominees were, you know, among the top grossing films of the year. So like, why isn't that true today? I, I don't even think you have to go back 30 or 40 years. I think you look at 10 years ago, we had Titanic, and, and five, six, seven years ago, we had Lord of the Rings and Gladiator and movies that were, you know, blowing the doors off the box office. And, and that simply has not happened over the last, you know, two, three, four years. And I think probably the biggest reason for that is that studios have shifted their focus elsewhere. I mean, they're making bigger and bigger movies and, and, and earning, in many cases, you know, higher and higher box office receipts. But they're doing that for these kind of summer ten polls that, of course, awards voters aren't particularly attuned to. Now, hold on. I want to ask, I want to stop you there for a second, because Gladiator, which a film which you just mentioned, is like one of my favorite movies of all time. And, uh, you know, it's a smart movie, but it's also a very big, commercial, popular movie. So the question is, what happened? What, is, is it that, that the movies need to be dumbed down because they're so expensive? They need to, they're, the studios have become so profligate that they, uh, they can't possibly... Um, risk not having every man, woman, and child on Earth see the film and under- be able to understand it? I think that's certainly a part of it. I think you're really, you're, what you're really seeing here is an attempt to get you know, as broad a hit as possible. And I don't know if that necessarily means dumbing down, but it certainly means taking out elements that the awards uh, voters tend to focus on and tend to respond to. So I think that's part of it. I mean, the other thing that's happening here, too, is let's not be completely, uh, or we would be completely remiss if we overlook this, and that is that awards voters tend to be having... Uh, at least now, you t- they tend to be going through a period of, of kind of more and more specialized taste. Um, you know, I, I, a movie I was sort of studying a little bit and kind of looking at some of the data for was American Gangster, which, you know, I, I wouldn't say it you know, resembles Gladiator in every respect. Of course, it, it shares uh, Russell Crowe. But this is a movie that Universal made, you know, at a fairly decent-sized budget, not as, not as high budget as Gladiator. Uh, but, you know, it has two stars, it's, so it's a star-driven vehicle. It's a smart, smart script. But once the awards talk, once the Oscar talk started to heat up, it wasn't really a movie movie that was getting a lot of traction. And again, I think some of that can be laid at the doorstep of voters who are just not looking at the studio divisions as likely sources of award films. They're looking at the specialty divisions. And, you know, American Gangster was clearly a studio product. It was a universal film. So I think it's a combination of what the studios are doing or not doing uh, and what awards voters are kind of homing in on. And and I think that sort of combination gives us uh, the sort of low budget awards contenders that we have today. You make the point in your piece about American Gangster, had it been released by Focus Features, things might have gone differently. Yep. Explain what you meant by that. Well, I think awards voters uh, tend to be paying attention to to sort of where a movie is coming from and how a movie is being flagged. I mean, basically, and, and not to get kind of too sort of wonkish about this, but I think over the last five years, you know, since the Oscar calendar was moved up, what we've really seen is a real concentration uh, kind of, of of sort of marketing and, and effort in a very short amount of time. And obviously, it starts with Toronto and kind of runs through the end of February. And I think one of the, one of the effects or the consequences of that is that there's a lot of of shorthand that goes on in that time to kind of parse, you know, what's considered an awards movie, what's a movie that, that uh, voters have to kind of pay attention to, what are we going to see, what are we going to see first, what are we going to prioritize? And I think that there are these kind of subtle ways of signaling, you know, what, uh, what's, what, what a studio and, or a specialty division is going to consider an awards contender and what, in turn, voters should be paying attention to or at least paying attention to first. And I think that the kinds of things that, that studios do or don't do will very much influence whether a movie gets that awards attention. And with a movie like American Gangster, to come back to that, um, the fact that it came out from a studio kind of, you know, had a very big commercial release and a pr- commercial campaign, I think, signaled at least to some voters that it was, you know, a sort of more commercial movie. And it was not a movie that maybe deserved the same kind of recognition that, that a movie coming out from a focus features like, a, like an atonement uh, would get. And, and maybe that's fine. I mean, that was the universal gambit. But uh, I think that had it gone out through focus and had a different kind of rollout, maybe a quieter rollout in some ways uh, and a smaller one, I think it would have signaled something different to voters, and I think they may have responded differently. If you're just joining us, we're speaking with Steven Zajic, a reporter for The Hollywood Reporter. We're talking about his February 14th article, Oscar's Big Fish Are Box Office Guppies. I, I want to ask you, what, what, is, is, there, is this cyclical, or is there like an ongoing trend here towards uh, deciding not to, to push certain films? Yep. 
he really had a pretty strong alignment between the movies that they were spending a lot of money to market, you know, kind of to the general public, and movies they were going to spend a lot of time on, and eventually, you know, in the last, you know, 10 years, a lot of money on uh, to, to get awards. And I think what we've started to see over the last few years is a real divergence of, in those two goals. And, you know, what everybody wants to know and what everybody's trying to figure out is, is, is this something that's going to stick? Or is this just kind of a temporary divergence and, and they're going to come back? But all the kind of spending that we've seen, you know, over the last few years, that's continuing apace. That has not abated at all. What I think has happened is that, you know, the movies are now much smaller movies and, and specialty divisions, not studios, are the ones spending money to get those those movies out. So a big studio film just isn't getting the awards push that it used to get. So they're spending more to get less. Well, that's that's as as generous a way as you can put it. I mean, the, the sort of the more the more kind of uh, critical or cynical view is that uh, they're basically you know pursuing a flawed and money losing economic model. I mean, this is this is you know a question of you know mo- awards movies making less and less money, and yet. The price of an award, the cost per, per award, the dollars spent on any you know best screenplay, best director, best actor is higher than ever, and and it, it's simply a case of the math not adding up. So who loses when Oscar does not equal big box office? Well, there's there's a couple of losers, and I think you know the biggest one probably, or at least the most evident one, you know, sort of as we as we kind of head into the home stretch of this award season, are the TV networks because uh, certainly, I mean, you look at this year with ABC airing the Oscars. Now, of course, they had the strike to contend with. They started promoting it uh, rather late. They didn't know if there was going to be a show, but there is no doubt that when you have a show with you know big stars and movies that people have seen, the ratings go up. I mean, you look back ten years ago, Titanic, and the you know 50 million viewers. You look even over the last five years, you know box office has trended down over the last five years, and the ratings have followed suit. So there's no question that the, the network that's broadcasting a, a show like the Oscars is going to feel the pinch. If people don't see the movies, if they're not aware of the, they may be aware of the stars, but if they're not aware of the movies the stars were in, they're not going to tune in in the same kind of numbers. And I think that, that that's the biggest uh, impact. You know, the other impact, of course, is, as we were just saying, to the studios, where if you're still going to spend a lot on awards, but you're not going to get the same bounce uh, from winning those awards, Ultimately, you're losing money. Now, they're going to argue that there's a prestige uh, value, there's brand value, there's sort of these intangibles that you can somehow, you know, you can't quantify, but you can still appreciate uh, when you win an award. That may be true. But again, from a purely uh, economic standpoint, there's no question that the way the award season is structured now and the way it's moving, um, the studios are losing money. Um, what, what, what's the chicken and what's the egg yep. here? Like, how did we, how did we get here? Was it simply that audiences stopped showing up for expensive studio films or was it the other way around? I think that if you actually look back at the history, and it's a fairly recent history of what happened, it really was driven by the studios first. Because, you know, as we've been talking about, you know, movies like Titanic, movies like Gladiator, movies like Lord of the Rings, I mean, audiences were turning out in droves to those movies, and those movies were winning awards. So, you know, it wasn't a question of, you know, all of a sudden all these awards movies were getting completely neglected by the American public. And so studios said, all right, forget it. We're just going to put them, you know, in our in our specialty divisions. I think the change really came, uh, for the most part, primarily from, the studios where they created these divisions, which you know I think is is it was a totally welcome and and sort of uh, uh, important uh, development where you, they said you know what we want to sort of give these movies the care and feeding that that they deserve and we can't do that at the level that we want to do it uh, within the sort of context of what we usually do so we're going to create these divisions. I think they didn't what they didn't foresee or intend was that uh, some of these specialty divisions as good as they would be at making movies and marketing movies, uh, that they wouldn't have the impact uh, and they wouldn't have the sort of best of both worlds uh, sort of qualities that they were hoping where you can, you know, care and feed for a movie, uh, you know, that wouldn't necessarily get that kind of attention, but still spend and and sort of have the muscle of a studio film. I think that second point is very hard to recreate at the specialty level. Um, and I think that's why some of these movies just aren't getting pushed out. And, you know, let's not look forget the content, too. I mean, some of these movies that are being made are smaller in scope. They're darker, as we've heard about. Um, they're not the kind of epic movies that you think of as a classic sort of Oscar, you know, whether it's a Ben Hur or whether it's even a Lord of the Rings or something like that. And so I think that that's probably a little, has a little bit to do with it too. But but it does seem to be coming more from the studios and less from the American public. So finally, what does this do to winning an Oscar and the Oscar economy? Does it diminish it? 
Well, you know, the escrow economy, it's this, it's this funny sort of uh, almost kind of dichotomy that we have here where it's like winning an Oscar now is still, because I think of the, of the sort of, um, the, you know, the, the kind of echo chamber of, of blogs and awards coverage and TV news magazine shows, uh, there's more coverage of and more attention on winning an Oscar and, and, and getting an award than ever before. So I think that, you know, as far as the sort of cultural um, significance of winning one. I don't think it's diminished at all. If anything, I think it's gone up. And I think as far as the economy goes, there are a lot of people who and, and entities that benefit from this whole sort of awards culture. That said, I think when you actually look at the movies themselves and the kind of, again, going back to the reason the Oscars were created and the way they functioned for so many years, where it's like, you know, a movie, you know, gets released, gets awards attention and, you know, continues to, be, to, to perform strongly in release and, and, of course, home video and, and in other ancillary markets, I think that's smaller than ever. So I think while the Oscar economy economy is, is pretty healthy as far as all the, 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 the many and diverse parties that can benefit from, you know, winning an Oscar or from just the, the kind of awards industrial complex. Uh, I do think that the actual specific impact of an Oscar for a particular movie and on, on the economics of that movie is really as small as it's ever been. So it's really kind of a, a strange sort of, you know, kind of binary world we're living in that way. So most important question, who are you wearing to the Oscars? Uh, as I'll be watching the uh, Oscars from our office writing stories, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining a good pair of jeans and a T-shirt. Well, okay. We'll leave it there. <laughs> Steve Zajic is the box office reporter and guru for The Hollywood Reporter. Steve, thanks for being on The Business. Thank you, Claude. Appreciate it. I drink your milkshake. I drink it up. My milkshake brings all the boys to the yard, and they're like, it's better than yours. In the late 60s, the studios were turning out a tremendous amount of schlock. Bloated historical epics, sappy family musicals, Don Knotts comedies, and Tencent westerns. Who could forget Rough Night in Jericho or Who's Minding the Mint? And yet, four of the five Best Picture nominees in 1967 turned out to be classics. Bonnie and Clyde, The Graduate, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and the eventual Oscar winner that year, In the Heat of the Night. Dr. Doolittle was the only real studio film on the list, and the only box office loser, hinting at a brewing Hollywood revolution that would boil over in the 1970s. But how is that revolution playing out today? Mark Harris is in a good position to compare and contrast the 1967 Best Picture nominees with today's class. He was a writer and editor at Entertainment Weekly, and now writes their back page column, Final Cut. He's also written a new book about the 1967 Best Picture Oscar nominees called Pictures at a Revolution, Five Movies, and the Birth of the New Hollywood. Matt Holzman spoke with Mark by phone from New York. Mark Harris, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, this is a book about how these five movies got made and how their selection uh, as, as Best Picture nominees hinted at how Hollywood was changing. So how was Hollywood changing? Well, I think the immediate effect we saw was not right after the Oscars, but a little bit after that, when Bonnie and Clyde and The Graduate, two of the nominees, and the most forward-looking two of the nominees, went on to become blockbuster hits. By the end of its run, The Graduate was the third highest grossing movie in history. At $44 million, which seems like such a small number now. but Right, but at the time it was uh, behind only The Sound of Music and Gone with the Wind, which is pretty incredible. Um, it also had a two-year theatrical run before it played itself out. Uh, so the immediate effect we saw was, you know, already apparent in 1968. Movies like 2001 and Rosemary's Baby were beginning to capture a new audience, and it inaugurated this great period of dark, interesting, more grown-up, more director-driven uh, American movies that lasted pretty much until the end of the 70s. We're talking to Mark Harris, author of Pictures at a Revolution, Five Movies and the Birth of the New Hollywood. Coming up, We'll compare the revolutionary 1967 Best Picture nominees with this year's crop. You're listening to The Business from NPR. You're listening to The Business, and I'm Claude brodesser Ackner. Four of the five Best Picture nominees in 1967 are now considered classics. Bonnie and Clyde, 
The Graduate, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and the eventual Oscar winner that year, In the Heat of the Night. That the fifth movie, Dr. Doolittle, was the only real studio picture and the only one of the five to flop at the box office hinted at a brewing Hollywood revolution. Looking at the five Best Picture nominees this year, you have to wonder if we're not on the brink of another one. Our Matt Holtzman is talking to Mark Harris, author of Pictures at a Revolution, Five Movies and the Birth of the New Hollywood, about the 1967 Best Picture nominees. In the book, and I'm going to quote you here, you say, In the early 1960s, the American studio film had bottomed out. Even many of its own manufacturers and purveyors felt they had dragged the medium to a creative low point. Quote, It wasn't just that we were sick of the system, recalls the director Arthur Penn. At that point, the system was sick of itself. So what was the system sick of, exactly? I think that the mid-level studio executives and certainly the directors and producers who were working within the system knew that they weren't putting out really exciting product anymore. They were leaning very, very heavily on what had worked for a long time, which was uh, family entertainment, big musicals, westerns whose plots and stars were getting older and older, biblical spectacles, and at the same time, this whole wave of exciting movies from Europe and France and Italy and Sweden and Japan was arriving, and these were movies that weren't restricted by the production code that governed the content of American movies and really forced filmmakers to keep anything grown up out of their films. All right, so let's bring it up to today. Now, thinking about the films that we're seeing as Best Picture nominees this year, how do you see what had started in 1967 kind of playing itself out. I think the real parallel between 1968 and 2008 is now when we look back at 1968, we realize that Bonnie and Clyde and The Graduate were the beginning of a revolution. But that was not apparent at the time. Those two movies, which were very inexpensive to make, and one of which was an indie, didn't necessarily signal to people the beginning of something new. They were more considered anomalies. And I think when we look at this year's movies, it's really hard to know. I mean, we have Juno, No Country for Old Men, Atonement, and There Will Be Blood, four of the five movies made by what I guess are called the Dependents or, or Indiewood, you know, the boutique labels of major studios. And that seems to me potentially a really big change in, in the way Hollywood does business that it's not going to be just big studio blockbusters versus tiny independent movies, but that there is this middle ground where filmmakers can have creative freedom, but the financing and marketing savvy and distribution ability that come with a studio. But it seems that this change, this kind of, uh, you know, the title of your book is Pictures at a Revolution. So your thesis is that there was a huge change in 1967 or the beginning of a huge change. Does it seem like that Hollywood has managed to avoid making that change by basically splitting itself into two? The studios stayed the same as they ever did, putting out the, the big schlock that they were so good at, and then just basically investing in these smaller films that they knew were Oscar bait. But Hollywood itself didn't actually change. Well, I would argue that it changed in the 70s. It changed for about a decade when studios were funding movies like Taxi Driver and The Godfather and Apocalypse Now. I mean, those weren't indies. The, the big movies of the 70s that we now consider classics, you know, from Nashville to Network, were studio movies. And you could argue that the revolution was followed in a way by a counter-revolution that began with Star Wars uh, in 1977, which was really the beginning of studios committing really, really intensely to potential blockbusters and giant opening weekends and making less and less room for more difficult material, and that that in turn led to the growth of independent film and, and Miramax and the big split that you're talking about between very synthetic, very formulaic studio movies and completely independent movies. The stories of how these five movies got made, which you go to in really fascinating detail, don't sound ultimately all that different from the way movies are made today. 
I think that's really true. Um, I think with all five of these movies, for better and in some cases for worse, a lot of what happens is accidental. Um, I mean, certainly there's real talent involved and real commitment involved in these movies. And, and, you know, I think the story of these movies is a testament to the importance of persistence, of fighting sometimes over years to do the movie you believe in. But a lot of it is coincidence. You, you know, Dustin Hoffman was found for The Graduate at the very, very end of a long and really fruitless process that involved looking very, very hard at Robert Redford. And, and Francois Truffaut almost directed Bonnie and Clyde. Yes, and Bonnie and Clyde at one time in Warren Beatty's mind was going to star Bob Dylan and Shirley MacLaine. <laughs> Now, In the Heat of the Night was not in theaters when it won Best Picture, but they re-released it, did they not? They did. Uh, it had opened the previous summer and pretty much had played out its run. It was it was really crowded out of theaters in some ways by To Sir With Love, uh, a more popular Sidney Poitier movie, and by Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Another United Sidney Poitier Artists, movie. Uh, yeah. United Artists did uh, re-release it, and, and The Graduate and... Bonnie and Clyde and In the Heat of the Night all made more money in 1968 than they did in 67. I wonder if that could happen now. Well, I think we'd be looking at these movies on Blu-ray or something. Right, exactly. One of the, the theses of your book is that the Best Picture nominees in some way kind of reflect the zeitgeist of what was going on in Hollywood. And now one of the major things that's changed since then is this whole idea of block voting, that basically there were people within the studios who could vote as a block for their movies and that those movies would then be nominated or, or go on to win. That does not happen anymore. So that do you still think that the films that are nominated for, for Best Picture reflect the business as a whole? Sometimes I think that the nominees for Best Picture reflect Hollywood's ambition and the winners often reflect reality. I think the the academy is is bolder and more adventurous certainly than it used to be but but bolder and more adventurous in picking nominees than uh it is in picking winners. I mean, I was very surprised this year to see There Will Be Blood, which is the model of the kind of movie that has always been thought to be too dark and too strange and too violent and too creepy for the academy get eight nominations. But I'd be very surprised to see it win best picture. It's in a way the most out there of the five nominees and whatever movie you would describe as the most out there in any year tends not to win but but having said that with with five best pictures none of which which are a big huge film can you say that these films in any way reflect i mean they they may reflect the artistic ideals of hollywood but do they in some way reflect the business you know, it's you can slice this two ways. Uh, I think people have complained this year that these nominees demonstrate that the Academy is out of touch with the kind of movies that most Americans want to see, as demonstrated by the box office. But you can also look at it and say Hollywood studios are now out of touch with any attempt to make really good movies. I mean, it's, it's very hard to... Uh, complain about popular movies not being nominated for Best Picture when, if you look at what that list would have been, uh, does anyone want to see a Best Picture lineup of Spider-Man 3 and Shrek the Third and Pirates of the Caribbean 3? Uh, I mean, if, if the big studios want to recreate that moment when you could have a really popular hit that was also a Best Picture nominee, they should make better movies. Mark Harris was a writer and editor at Entertainment Weekly, where he now writes the back page column Final Cut. His new book is Pictures at a Revolution, Five Movies and the Birth of the New Hollywood. Mark, thank you for talking with us on The Business. Thanks for having me. And that's The Business. Matt Holzman produced and edited today's program with production assistance from Ray Warner. Our associate producer is Darby Maloney. You can listen to this or any past program online anytime at kcrw.com slash thebusiness. You can also podcast the show on KCRW's site or through iTunes. Our email address is thebusiness at kcrw.org. The Business is produced by KCRW Santa Monica and distributed by National Public Radio. I'm Claude Bredesser-Acton. We'll see you next week on The Business. <laughs>